Now, you change the how to. You can change the how to, no problem. Your, your aim doesn't change, your goal doesn't change. Make your goal smart, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and time bound. And really, it's not difficult. The point is, if you can't have the capital like we didn't have the capital initially, you go to family and friends and you really collect, start small, aim big, but collect the money, start off, show a proof of concept. I think that's what's happening for a lot of entrepreneurs today. If you go and see our new bypasses on, 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 from Thika Road or Southern Bypass, just go and see there were no shops existing there. Today there are probably 250 shops already existing there. Different types, servicing needs, needs of travelers, needs of you know, uh, food, needs of drinks, needs of you know, whatever, car repairs, innovation, entrepreneurship is there. We just need to nurture that spirit. Even the person on the road, when there's traffic jams, you've seen people are working shops, right? Yes. On the traffic jams on the Uru Highway, you see people selling stuff. Those are entrepreneurs. But here's your problem. I'll be in traffic on Uhuru Highway and look and see everyone is thirsty and so I decide let me go and sell water. By next week there will be a hundred of us selling water. They'll all come and take up uh, what I would have earned. It's, it's always like that. People will always copy what you do but the one who is selling it with passion, the, the one who is selling it chilled, the one who is selling it differentiated is going to be the winner. At what point do we... Uh, yeah. No, I just wanted to add to that to again go back to the issue of the lab to say that Yes, so many other people can copy you, but U.S. is a lot more grounded and more powerful because it's coming from the heart. And for that reason, you become a lot more innovative in even beating that competition. But let's face it, some of us want to be in commodity businesses. I want to sell chicken. A chicken is a chicken is a chicken. Yep. So how much more creative can I get? Can I say something yes. here? I think um, one thing that we need to just be very clear about, when we, when we use terms like business plan, mm -hmm. um, in our heads, sometimes we can think that's reams and reams of paper, or how do I do this? I have no idea. So just looking at a business plan, you can go on Google right now. If you Google business plan and you hit images, you will find one-page documents which are going to show you exactly how to put together your business plan. Your business plan can go on one page. So to your point, whether it's chicken or whether it's water, it's something that everybody else is selling, it doesn't matter because very quickly you will be disciplined enough to be able to see how you're going to be able to differentiate yourself. And that's the discipline of putting together a business plan. But again, we want to make sure that we don't think that it's something inaccessible, that you need to have an MBA to put together a business plan. It's just not true. It's very simple. The templates are out there. Let's yeah, go to, yeah. to that. Sorry, let me, let me interrupt a bit, Wallace, to say that we also need to caution potential entrepreneurs, and particularly the young people, about over-reliance on a business plan. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we put them together and they're scared. It becomes your fetish. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> and also, some of them, you put the numbers, the numbers will never add up, all right? Second, there are too many unknowns that you cannot be able to capture at the very onset, you know, to inform your business plan. So, sometimes you just have to, of course, you, you, need, you need an outline, you need some sort of, mm -hmm. um, you know, a tool to broadly guide you, but it should not scare you. Just follow your heart. If you're really, really passionate about it, if you really believe in that, um, you know, uh, whatever line of business you want to take up, you need to pursue it, and pursue it uh, brutally. I want to go to the other extreme. I've been speaking about very simplistic ideas. I want to sell water that's different. I want to sell chicken. When you want to go either very sophisticated or go global like you did, um, Evans, what is the scary bit about that and how do you overcome it? Because now it's no longer about coming to Nairobi and making it in Nairobi. It's about going global and saying, I can do this thing in a way that I know the Chinese will not be able to do. I know the Vietnamese will not be able to do. I know even the Americans will not be able to do. I'm sitting here in Kenya and I know I'll conquer the world. I think it comes down to what George was saying earlier about you know, that, that passion. If you have the passion, you always you know, remain, remain innovating on how uh, you, you do your business on what you come up with. So you'll always you know, find your niche, in, 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 you know, even if there's so many other people doing the same thing. But don't you get scared? Let's, let's be practical here. Get scared, but, but, but I also think that you know, uh, it's important to look at you know, who, uh, the people who are in you know, different markets or in different uh, areas whom you can be able to work with and so that you can, it makes it easier for you to, to, you know, to, to, to expand, it makes it easier for you to uh, reach out new kinds of customers that you would have not you know, reached to if you are just doing it alone. So I think uh, being able to, to know that you, know, you have your limitations, you, in, you understand this area but you can't understand everything else or everywhere else. and so. Let me collaborate with somebody else who understands that, you know, that area or that market or that technology or that business world. And then we can share ideas on how, you know, whatever 
common objectives we have. I think that's really, really important. You've you got the magic word collaboration. <laughs> Name myself and I'll speak about myself. I hate sharing glory. If I have an idea, it's mine. I want you to recognize that it's mine, and I'm the one who brought it, I'm the one who's made it successful. I think, and most of us are like I that. I think I kind of, personally, I really believe in open source. You know, I really believe that we are in a world where, whether we like it or not, soon enough, everything will be shared everywhere. And so we, we should, like this thing we call like proprietor, you know, things, you know. It's not going to be to differentiate how people but Let's face it, it's people, you, you will meet Evans, you will meet people like me who yeah. want in Kiswahili, you said to Shikilia, we want to Shikilia that thing until the but end. You, you can hold on to that, and then you want to be able to grow, or you can be able it's to... It's fine, I'll, I'll survive. And, and, I think it comes from before Google, right? If you have exactly. passion, if you really yeah. have passion, then yes. your passion will drive you that. If I want to be able to, know, to, do, to do this by, you know, in 2016, I want to be here. And if the passion is driving you to do that, then you'll find all, whichever path to, to use to reach that, that goal that you have. But if you don't have a strong enough passion, so I mean, you won't be able unless, to do that. Unless your idea is stolen, why would you want to hang on? You know? <laughs> because <laughs> human nature, let me, let me answer your question. Yeah, and I totally agree with But let me answer your question because now you're the questioner. Yeah. Human nature is such that I am me and I want to have the pride, even if it's just to brag at the pub on the weekend. <laughs> or I want to be recognized as Steve Jobs when I come to the end of my life. There's a human thing that says I have to have the glory. And it's a very strong thing that leads people to not be able to do well. So Wallace, can I just say yes. that um, if you look at leadership models uh, across the world, they're changing. Mm -hmm. So that leadership model of top down, you know, I hold on to things, I say you do, that's changing. What's happening is that the, with, with the millennial generation, in fact, their leadership model is around collaboration, around crowdsourcing, um, around sharing. So those are the models that are coming into place. And what I'm saying, and I've said this many times, I'll put it very bluntly, that if you're still in that mindset of top down, holding on, not collaborating, I'm afraid you're going to become a dinosaur. But very I know very soon. many selfish 22 year olds. Huh? George, I know very many selfish 22 year olds. <laughs> yes, indeed. I mean, it's, like you rightly said, it's human nature. But then again, if you are in love with this idea, you realize that it starts dictating to you what you must do for and with that business. It's just like I said earlier, if you're in love with a lady, it dictates so many things, how you dress, why you date her, what you know, you do with her when you meet her and so forth. So ah. similarly, if this idea is not a copy, where you're saying, you know, I hold on because you know, I, I don't want other people to know what I'm doing, then obviously you may end up there. But the new world, like um, Ben Patel said here, it almost dictates that you have to be more open, you have to be more inclusive, you have to be, you know, sorry to use this word, democratic in terms of how you, you go about everything. Because you so do, you what, lose what is, me entirely. How long, how long have you got to keep your idea secret? The minute you take it out, you give it to a customer, it's out there. But the more practical thing is not necessarily keeping my idea secret. It's that I'll start with my idea, but I would want to hold on to it as CEO, whatever title I'll give myself. But I want to hold on to it for that, to the level where, like Evans, you're saying, you're actually not able to grow the company or grow the institution because... I insist that no, even if you give me money, even if you um, come and purchase equity in my company, you cannot purchase so much equity that I lose control. Unfortunately, your times are up because those people who are in that command control situation are not going to exist going forward. The world is changing so fast. You bring out your product, people are going to see your product, they're going to dismantle your entire product or service and see how you do it, what price you do it at, what's your quality and they're going to better you always, right? How you differentiate in the mind of the consumer is going to be different. Again, not only this differentiation, differentiation or die was the catchword before, today is disrupt or die. If you don't disrupt the status quo, right, you won't be existing for too long. So there's a lot of disruption coming into the markets. If you look at Uber, right, it's disrupting the whole cab market. Uh, in the same manner, even in news media, right, you're going to have a lot of disruption. So if I sit, sit on to my idea and say, nobody should know it, the minute you take out your product, you're in the market. Everybody knows about it. T today's young youth today, look at them. On Facebook, they put down everything. They even put down where they were last night, whom they were with. You would never do that. That's what you think. <laughs> <laughs> leadership. Yes. Because you, you raise the issue of leadership and it's coming as part of this um, little conversation we're having here. Mm -hmm. How do you display it if it's not a title-based thing? Because it's easy to say, no, everyone is a leader, but at some point it becomes a cacophony. You cannot actually hear anyone. Someone does need to say, and this is where we are going, and this is how we're going to get there. 
Yeah, so I think leadership, first of all, is situational to a great extent. Um, and when we're thinking about leadership, we have to think about what's the kind of leadership that we're demonstrating in a certain place. So to give you an example, uh, the basis of leadership, I think in this day and age, one of the things that's really important is to be collaborative, as I said, okay, to have consensus building as well in order to move forward. But we have to think about it in an emergency situation too. If you're in an emergency situation, um, you can't sit there and be consensus building. You actually have to be direct and say, this is what's happening, this is how we're going. But who then do we listen to? Let's imagine we're in a collaborative space of 20 or 30 of us, this yes. room, and a fire breaks out. Don't anyone light a fire. <laughs> but a fire breaks out. Everyone has an idea of what to do. No, I think we should all leave immediately. No, some of us should stay in the fire. It's not that serious. That sort of environment always comes when you're trying to build a business. Mm -hmm. People have all sorts of different notions about what mm -hmm. should happen. Mm -hmm. You talk collaboration, you talk leadership at every level. Mm -hmm. To me, it's just a cacophony. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things to remember as well is one of the key elements of leadership is actually influence. So again, looking at collaboration, looking at uh, all of those other skills, we have to think about how are we influencing people. That example of all of us being over here, uh, we're going to have to look at who is it that we're going to listen to. It's going to be the person with the greatest amount of influence. Mm -hmm. Okay, What do we mean by How do you gauge that? Yes. Yeah. How do, what do I mean by influence? So you asked me right at the beginning. You said you don't talk, right? So one of the things, you ask questions to leaders, I observe leaders. Mm -hmm. So some of the data that I've put together is actually Actually, what are those observable behaviors of world-class leaders and what makes them influential? And there are essentially four. The first one is to be influenceable. And that means being in a position where you're going to listen to people, right? So we hear, for example, uh, Vimal often talks about KYC, very often talks about KYC. Know your customer, know your county, know your country, know your competition. That skill is actually about listening being agile enough to understand what is going on and then moving forward. The second one is building relationships. In order to be influential, you have to build relationships. That's something that, again, comes with the collaboration piece. The third piece is the pushing. So those who are really influential have worked out exactly how it is that they can push and how far they can push. If I give you an example, if you hear, if, when you say no, they don't hear no. They actually hear not just now, not right now. They're constantly pushing the barrier of what they need to do in order to get to a certain result. So um, those, are, those are, I think, the main things that we have to look at when we're looking at how do we build uh, an influential leadership as well. To answer your question, who's the person that they would follow if this room was on fire? Most likely, they're going to follow the person that they know uh, best, okay, um, and the person who has had the greatest influence over them in the past week, day, or even the past few hours. Vimo, one of the things that we're most afraid of when we sort of toss our heads above the parapet is people throwing stones at us. So I go off and say, you know what, I'd rather stay an employee because when I'm an employee and things go wrong, there's an MD, there's a CEO to take the flak. When I go off on my own, as the saying goes, you cannot undertake a journey if you're going to stop at every dog that barks at you. How do you counter that? Because some of us are very shy. We it's don't want everyone to come and criticize us. I think it's simple. First and foremost, you must know yourself. You must know who you are. You must have a very clear conscience. Uh, the other thing is you must have a very aligned organization. So if you're starting off and you're just one or two people, you must all assure yourself that we are on the same track. We're, our mission is the same. When you become 10 people, 20 people, 100, 200, you must make sure everybody's aligned towards the same mission. It's not about me or you. It's about aligning together. Now, when you're aligned, then you see congruence happening. And then everybody knows what are we doing and why are we doing this, right? Number two, if, look, any good idea, people are going to throw stones at you. Even when we have a problem in universities, people go and throw stones. The point is, what are we going to do about it? First and foremost, make sure we are okay. Make sure our communication is also right. Let people also know what mission we are on. But let's, speak, let's speak on a smaller level. I sit here, I'm 25 years old, out of university, and here's a job offer from Bitco, come in and become our technology guru. But I've always had an idea to do solar lamps. And my parents, my siblings, my family comes and says, how stupid are you? How can you give up this opportunity to go off, become something in an existing organization, as opposed to going off on your own? Now, these are not necessarily dogs. They're just very loud relatives. I would say, uh, follow your passion. If your passion is solar lamps, go out and do solar lamps. 
you will make it work because you have a passion for that. The other job is something you're doing because your relatives or your friends or your peers are pushing you towards that. It's going to be short-lived. But I come from an African environment, Vima, let's be practical. We have to listen to these guys. If my mother is here in my ear, well, I cannot well, dismiss her, George. If you socially conform, you never make it. Mm -hmm. no, 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 no. I'm not going to accept that because it's easy for you to say it. Because yes. there will be too many dogs around, as you, as you said, you know, barking at you, and you never move. I think so for that reason, you have to, um, uh, you know, manage uh, those social expectations. You must be able to, because of the passion that you have. And that, that, and that George, you know, hold on, that is a question. How do you manage? I'm not talking about just anyone who comes and says, no, you're this and you're that and the other. These are people who have your best interest at heart. Indeed. They will tell you in this environment, in this day and age, where you come from, who you are, etc., etc., this is a safer option. And they don't even foreclose the idea of you going off by yourself. They'll tell you, do it after five years. Do it after ten years. Do it after two years. I, I would suggest one thing there. Follow your passion, make it work, and then thereafter, once it's successful, everybody's going to respect you. We what if it's not? Even if it's not, people are going to say, fine, they're going to throw stones. But you've got to know how I'm going to steer and navigate and make it happen. Change it around. The point is, if you don't follow your passion and you live up to other people's expectations, soon you're going to die out because your, your, your love or your passion, as, as, as George called it, is going to die away. You're going to be one of the me-toos. And then you're going to be unhappy, you're going to be frustrated, you're going to have all those problems. I think the world will help you, the universe will help you. Go on, George. And, and yeah, I wanted to add to say that I've come around, you know, across a lot of people who, who are doing well, very well financially as a matter of fact, but they're not happy with what they do. Why? Okay. Because they're socially conformed. They were backed up by so many dogs, so they ended up doing what all those dogs wanted them to do. And they're successful, but they're not happy. So that's what I'm saying. This thing that comes from here, it will surprise you how much position power you'll have to persuade anybody that matters in your life to come along. Okay? Bolting from the capital city where life is nice and cozy, to go to a village that has no power, water, and any social amenity to set up the Tafaria castle was quite a feat. But it was so powerfully coming from here that I was able to convince everybody, my wife, and of course my mom, who actually would like his son to remain, her son to remain in the city. Would you have done it? Would you have done it at the age of 25? You sorry? Would you have done that at the age of 25? Had I the economic means? Yes. I would have because it, it's been a childhood dream. It's something like, and that's why I'm likening this thing with love. Whereby if a lady that you love is mentioned, what happens? Your heart even skips a few bits. There's a not. You sometimes will start sweating and so forth. So <laughs> this whole idea of transforming that village has been so powerful and you know with me since I was young. So it's something that I so I have to do it and do it at some point. So yes, the, the, the answer is I'll still do it. I think uh, <clears throat> you know for me personally, you know, like after going through college, you know, we were, we were, we were studying engineering. You know, of course, the expectations is you know when you study engineering, go build a road. You will yeah. probably get a, a, you know. A, a job that you pays way above average of you know so many of the other careers in this country, and and so that was the expectation of you know everybody in my family and you know everyone around me. But I I, I had a passion that I wanted to to do something uh, that I can still be able to make it. And so of course everyone won't support you, but if you have that passion and you have certain that goal, so eventually when they see that. Whatever you keep talking about is you are, you are walking that route. You keep on walking the same path that you, you talk about. And eventually they realize that, okay, he means what he, what he talks about. Mm -hmm. But if you keep on talking about something but you don't follow, no, no, no. follow it with action. So if you talk, say that I want to start this venture by next month, when it reaches next month and you haven't done anything about it, then people won't take you seriously. But if and, and Twitter makes money and they've done something, yeah. then everyone wants to change their, their mindset on how they view, you know, or their mm. expectations about you. You know, when I left corporate life, now it's about three years ago, and I remember resigning on the 10th of June, and 11th of June, which was a Saturday, I was up in the village, and the first call I got was from my friend David D, and he told me that, George, welcome to the world of a nobody. And I asked him, David, what do you mean? It's going to be tough for you being in this Kenyan society without a title. I had not realized what I had done up until then. However, the point I'm trying to make is this. It took me less than a year to convince the people that I was involved in the project to actually start following what he's doing. Because 
they understood because you have that passion that is coming out of the love of the idea that you have. You're able to win over people and there comes the leadership that she's talking about. You are then able to lead quite easily and the moment you share the idea, it surprises you actually that people own it and they bring forth ideas and suggestions bigger than what you actually even thought. But here's, here's, what's, here's what's occurring to me and I, I, I want you to come in on this but before you do that I won't be able to come in. What's occurring to me from the three of you is Either you have very strong personalities or you are to be unfriendly, you are very egotistical. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, 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 it stems from what I have been talking about the whole afternoon. And I say it, I start... Well, it's fine for you to tell me it's love and everything coming from the inside, but someone no, who's observing you I start by will say George is a very egotistical guy. He's a very... Egotistical person. No, look, people will say you are a risk taker, you are determined, you are passionate, you are all those things. Those are your friends. Is the other side. Yeah, yeah. But, but I can tell you all those things are actually a byproduct of pursuing that which you believe in with brutal consistency, as I call it. Okay? And therein, you take risks without knowing that you're taking risks. You, 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 you know, sell your ideas to the people that you need without even knowing that actually that's the amount of power that you use to sell your idea. You go persuade people to give you money, you go persuade banks to, you know, to give you money without knowing actually that is what you're doing. You only look in his and realize, wow, that is what determination means. Wow, that is what risk taking means. Vimal, you've never had that, you never had that accusation thrown at you. As opposed to being forward looking, very determined, people just look at it and say you've got a huge ego. Um, I should know what I have, right? Uh, a lot of people will judge you differently mm -hmm. and I think it's not important how people judge you because people want to misjudge you at times it could come out of whatever reasons they have but if you have if you are driven by a purpose uh, what is your purpose in life anyway if we look at it for anybody I would say it's happy healthy living right yes. you want to be living happily healthily and, and you want to live now if you want to do that you're going to do the right thing number one number two you're going to make sure you're happy what George talks about when you are happy, you wish to do something, you want to do it, it's so easy, it's not even a task. Monday morning is not a bother to go to work. It's like, hey, I want to do it. It's so easy. And that's love, right? Number one. Number two, I think when you have a clear-cut purpose driven there, when you're happy, you're healthier. Okay? So that way, you know what you're doing. And when your conscience is clear, when you don't have a problem, let people throw as many stones at you. It doesn't matter. But you know what you are. You've all also got to be important. The important thing is you do not go to arrogance because arrogance is where people get defeated. To say, I'm the doer and I did all this stuff. No, it happens through me, but it happens through the people that I work with and the entire team that I have. It's not a singular thing anyway. So it's about all that. And it, ultimately, at the end of it all, every corporate will acquire an ego. I mean, today, Coca-Cola, GE has an ego, a collective ego. But that's because they have achieved something. Whenever you achieve something, when you achieve this castle, when he was building, I'm sure he was sweating. He had fears. He had said, what if it doesn't work? It's fear of failure. But that's a big issue in entrepreneurship today. A lot of people are being stopped by fear of failure. I don't want to fail, so I don't want to start off. Spooky, I'm sorry, this guys are making it sound a bit too easy. And I'm getting a bit worried. Because someone will watch this and say, now nah, they can only speak like that because they have made it. I'm here on the other side of the success hill. Um, I broke my father's heart when I told him that I didn't want to be a lawyer after practicing for about 10 years. Okay? Um, and when I made that decision that I didn't want to practice anymore, I remember being in the uh, counselor's, career counselor's office, mm -hmm. and she said to me, uh, she said, you know, what's bothering you? Okay? Why is this so hard? And I introspected and I came back with a response, and I said to her, actually, it's loss of status. That's what it is. I will no longer exactly be able to Exactly what George is talking about. Yeah. So, in fact, what you have to think about is people are going to look at you differently. You know, you won't have that status to say, I'm a lawyer, okay? But it's the humility that pushes you through and says, I don't care if I don't have status. My dream is so powerful that I will have, I have the drive, I have the persistence, I have the patience to, to wait five years to make it go all the way through. So I don't know that they're making it sound easy. I think it's because they're at a level where they make it look it's easy. But that's not true. If you were to examine actually, their lives, they're actually, it's very, very tough. Yeah, let me interject there to say that, uh, and like I said, you know, earlier on, I apologize on behalf of everybody who, you know, have been successful as, as you put it. Because 
every time you tell your story, you make a lot of people feel inadequate. Okay, mm -hmm. you make people actually feel it's too big. I can never build an empire like this, for instance. But I would encourage people to look back at the beginning, okay, and follow those steps. In fact, forget about exactly. Bitcoin as it starts now. Forget about Safari as it look, looks like now. Go back to the very beginning, and that way you feel a lot more empowered. Because when you look at the end result, it's very disempowering, as a matter of fact, because it completely looks out of reach. It's, it's too big. The other thing I would like to say is that um, the measure of success is not size. Because, because of the way we are schooled and, and brought up in society, whereby we are all measured using the same measuring instrument in terms of how successful you are in school, for instance, grades and so forth, we tend to carry that on into, into our lives, businesses, and so forth. But the success of what you're doing should be measured against your set dream, okay? And that's how you feel fulfilled, because there are a lot of very successful people, you know, out there, but they feel too small, that, uh, you know, comparatively. They look at Bitcoin and say, well, I'm, I'm too small a company, I'm not successful. But that should not, should not be it. It should be, what did I set out to do? And how well am I doing against that particular size of my dream. And I think it comes back to this issue around ego and the piece around the risk for failure, that you've actually got to get over your ego and you've got to be humble enough to say, you know, if I fail and I get it all wrong, that's 